Building your own video editing PC. Intimidating? Yes. Complicated? Well, not really. It's actually a lot easier than you think. When you build your own PC, you'll be reaping the benefits way longer down the line than if you bought a stock PC or a Mac. So if you want to speed up renders and rip through 4K footage, today I'm going to be showing you what parts you're going to need, how those parts are going to benefit the programs that you'll use, and then we're going to build this PC step by step. Soon enough, your renders will be as simple as this. Let's get started. So recently my old daily driver Mac decided to bite the dust and slow down really bad on render times and crash a lot. So the office gave me some money and told me to build my own PC so we can have something in the office that can handle really big renders or really complicated motion graphics. So you may ask, why should you build your own computer? Well, for one, and most importantly, it's incredibly cheaper than buying a stock PC or especially a Mac. A Mac with the same specs as all the parts that I just purchased is literally double the price, which is ridiculous. Yes, I know Mac's iOS is really user friendly and for longtime Mac users, it may be what you're comfortable with and you already know all the macros too, but Windows new software is not something to be scared by and with their newest updates and Windows 10, it's really not that hard to use. It's also a great future-proof investment. You know, if you get a part that becomes outdated, just replace it. There's no need to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I don't know if that's a Southern saying or not that I've just been saying my whole life, but how could you forget the baby when you throw the water out? Never mind. It's completely modular, so you can replace outdated parts on the go until maybe one day you have a full-blown ship of Theseus on your hands. Also, in the future, whenever you have the budget for better parts, you know, you can just replace just one thing at a time instead of making sweeping investments every three to five years like you would with a stock Mac. Also, to me at least, it's just super fun to build your own PC. Learning the ins and outs of your computer whenever you're building it really helps you out in the future when you may run into problems and you just want to fix it yourself. It's kind of like preparing your own car. It's going to save you money in the long run. And you really shouldn't be intimidated by the aspect of building your own PC. It really is kind of like putting together a really expensive Lego set. There's absolutely no soldering or coding you have to do to get it running. So, on to the parts. And I will give you a little disclaimer here. My office gave me a very, how do you say, generous budget. So I used it all. This build may not be in the budget of a normal video editing PC builder, so for every part, I'll give you the best lower cost options that I can think of. So let's start off with an editing computer's most important part, the CPU, or the central processing unit. The CPU is the brains of the whole operation, and it performs the calculations and processes needed to run the OS and the software. Now something many people new to the PC parts world is that the CPU is actually the thing that's going to be speeding up your video renders and your video previews. Most mainstream NLEs like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut utilize the CPU way more than they do the GPU, so your biggest investment should be the CPU, unless you're editing in DaVinci Resolve, which we'll get to later. If you're budgeting out how much you want to spend on each part for your new PC, I definitely recommend going for a really high quality processor and then, you know, not balling out too much on a high tier GPU. Now when choosing a CPU, look at how many threads and cores it has. The higher number of cores and threads that your processor has, the faster your renders will be. That's because many NLEs utilize these cores and threads to dilute the workload among all cores available, thus avoiding too much throttling during CPU intensive tasks. Our processor of choice is the Intel i9-9900K. This monster processor has just about everything you need. 8 cores, 16 threads, and up to 5 gigahertz of speed. It will comfortably blaze through 4K footage and won't leave you high and dry when going through a very intensive edit. I was actually debating between the i9 and the AMD Ryzen Threadripper series because the Threadripper has double the amount of cores and double the amount of threads for just about the same price. But the problem that I ran into is that the Threadripper is actually a bigger size than the i9 in most conventional processors, so you have to get a bigger motherboard and you have to get bigger parts, and it just kind of upped the price higher than I wanted it to be. Our budget-friendly option for you is the AMD Ryzen 2700X. It's got 8 cores and 16 threads, just like the i9, but it won't break the bank at coming in to around $300. Back in the day, you used to be laughed out of a room for using AMD processors in your build. But after they released their Ryzen series of processors about a few years ago, they've become a really formidable opponent to Intel, and they're a really, you know, low-cost, affordable option for just about the same speed you would get with Intel processors. To cool the CPU, we're going to be using something called a CPU cooler. 
So CPUs get really hot whenever they start to use and you have to use a CPU cooler to keep them at a low temperature. So that's why we chose to use the Kraken X52 liquid cooler. While some processors might actually come with their own cooling fan, I highly recommend investing in a liquid cooler for your CPU. Editing and rendering is going to put a lot of workload on your CPU and it's going to get really hot, especially if you're overclocking it. With a typical CPU fan, you run the risk of maybe overheating your CPU and maybe accidentally melting the chipset, which you obviously don't want. Liquid CPU coolers work by connecting a head mount to the processor, which funnels into a radiator that cools the liquid in a continuous loop, which in part cools the CPU without too much noise. We chose NZXT Kraken X52 liquid cooler, not only for its proven reliability, but just because it looks so crisp inside the NZXT case. Ours cost us about $150, so if you're looking for a more affordable liquid cooler, Cooler Master makes some for about $70 to $80, like the Master Liquid series. Now onto the GPU, the Graphics Processing Unit. If you're going to be doing any graphics intensive work or color correction and grading, the GPU will be powering these effects. For a while, an expensive GPU wasn't really needed for video editing until Adobe Premiere started offloading some of the work onto the GPU instead of mainlining it through the CPU. You'll actually see a little box next to some effects in Premiere to let you know that the GPU is going to be processing that power. What to look out for when shopping for a GPU is the amount of gigabytes of memory and the amount of CUDA cores inside of the GPU. The higher amount of memory on the GPU, the more graphics intensive processes that you can put onto it. Now, if you don't know what CUDA cores are, that's just Nvidia's name for their processing units. I won't and honestly can't go into the specific of what these cores do, but if you're an Adobe user, there's actually an option that you can use to utilize the CUDA cores and offload some of the workload onto both processing units. We decided to go with an EVGA GeForce 2080 GPU, mostly because of its relative affordability, the high 8 gigabyte memory, and 2,944 CUDA cores. These cores will optimize your rendering times, and if you're building this PC for a little gaming on the side as well, it's gonna handle just about any game that you throw at it. Our GPU also comes with USB-C integration, so I can hook up our monitors in the office that use USB-C to connect for display. For a more affordable option, I recommend staying within the GTX and RTX families because of their CUDA cores. So a 1050, a 1060, a 1070, the TI versions of any of those will work just fine in the $200 to $400 range. Before we move on from GPUs, I think it's fitting to mention one of the outlier NLEs when it comes to utilizing the GPU. Blackmagic's DaVinci Resolve. Resolve actually uses the GPU for processing and rendering way more than the CPU does. So if you're a faithful Resolve user, I recommend just flipping my recommendation completely and investing most of your money in a really good graphics card and then saving a little bit more on your CPU. If you're a user of multiple NLEs, it doesn't hurt to have a good GPU and a good CPU. This will also give you some future proofing whenever Adobe Premiere inevitably starts utilizing the GPU for their program. So you're gonna need some memory to power this machine, so you're gonna need random access memory, otherwise known as RAM. RAM processes information in active programs and helps run all those programs that you may have open at one time. So one misconception about RAM is that uh, people will say that more RAM equals faster speeds. Now technically that's only half true. Computer programs, when open, require a certain amount of RAM to run at full optimization. Say for example, whenever you're running Adobe Premiere, uh, at the current time it only needs 9 gigabytes of RAM to run at 100% optimization. If you have 16 gigabytes of RAM, then you'll be fine, as long as you don't have any other programs open that are eating up RAM. But if you want to hop over to After Effects or Photoshop to uh, create a graphic, then that might increase your RAM threshold to over 16 gigabytes, which will throttle performance. So having a lot of RAM won't speed up your computer per se, but having a lot of it is kind of a safety measure to uh, make sure that nothing gets throttled whenever you have a lot of programs open, which video editors usually do. We recommend getting about 32 gigabytes of RAM for your build. It will be plenty to have about two or three different programs open and still run at about 100% optimization. We decided to get two sticks of 16 gigabyte RAM to leave some room on our other two slots on our motherboard in case we wanted to increase memory in the future. If you want to save a bit of money though and you're fine topping out at 32 gigabytes, purchasing four eight gigabyte sticks could save you about 50 to 100 bucks. On to our next topic, your storage options. Now for video editors, you're probably gonna require a large amount of space because video files are usually very large files. There are three types of drives currently on the market. That's the HDD, the SSD, and the M.2 drives. HDDs are the oldest and cheapest forms of storage. They utilize a spinning disk to write information onto. This, however, makes it a really slow drive because of the moving parts. That's why most video editors have been switching over to SSDs or solid state drives. 
SSDs are basically like really large flash drives. Uh, they have no moving parts and they can access information about 10 times faster than an HDD could. The boot time on an SSD will take you about three to five seconds compared to an HDD, which will take like 30 or 40 seconds. If you ever had an older computer, you probably noticed this because they probably have an HDD inside of them and it takes, you know, two to three minutes to boot your computer. Editing footage off of an SSD is going to really speed up your access times, such as import speeds and the time it takes your NLE to compile footage. Now some new technology that's come out in the past few years is the M.2 drive, which we actually decided to use in our build. This tiny little chip can hold two terabytes of information and it plugs directly into the motherboard, so no need for wires. This only cost us about $230, which is just astounding for someone like me who spent $200 on a 256 gigabyte solid state drive just a few years ago. With two terabytes of storage on the M.2, I opted just to use that as my drive and not get any more supplemental SSDs or HDDs. And then just if I need more space, I'll plug in some external drives. A setup that a lot of people use that don't wanna to spend too much money on storage is a SSD and HDD combo. All the programs in the operating system is stored in the SSD for speed optimization. And then you store your video files and music files all onto an HDD, which you can buy like, you know, five terabytes for like 120 bucks. It's really cheap. So we have all of our key components listed and we're gonna be putting all those together onto the motherboard. Now the motherboard is not technically associated with performance, but it does limit or expand your options for connections. For video editors, you're gonna want a really fast USB connection speed. So look for a motherboard with lots of USB 3 slots and maybe a Thunderbolt slot if you can find it. When looking for a motherboard, make sure it's compatible with the processor that you chose. The easiest way to tell if it's compatible is taking all of your components and plugging them into a website called PCPartPicker.com. This website will tell you about any compatibility issues that you might run across. And I've personally used it for all my other builds because it's a great place to compile all the parts that you need together in one place. The motherboard that we are using is the Asus Strix Z390E. Since it has a plethora of connection availability and a slot to insert my M.2 hard drive. Don't worry about dropping too much cash on your motherboard though. Something in the range of $100 to $150 will suit you just fine. If you stick with one that's called a gaming motherboard, it's sure to fit all the components that you might have. To finalize the parts list, all that's left is the case and the power supply. Now a case is something that you can look for in a cosmetic way instead of functionality. Just check and make sure it has really good airflow by checking the reviews and ratings online. They'll be sure to tell you what case is good for you. There are also different sizes like full tower, mid tower, and micro tower. And that choice all depends on the size of your build. Want to throw 10 HDDs for storage inside of your PC? Well, then you might go with a full size tower then. We chose the NZXT midsize since it has such great ratings, it looks great, and it can fit on top of my desk without towering over me. For the power supply or the PSU, you need to make sure that it has enough watts to power your entire build. For that, you can refer to your PC part picker list and it will tell you the exact wattage your build requires. Make sure to give it a little bit of buffer room though. Whenever you're uh, overclocking your PC or putting it through really hard strain like rendering or doing really graphics intensive stuff, uh, it may require more wattage. So just give it a little bit more buffer room. Uh, it's better to play it safe than sorry. We went with a thousand watt supernova platinum power supply. Now, if you're familiar with PC parts, you may say that that is way too much for this build that we have currently. The requirements for all these parts is only just about like 700 watts. Well, I had the budget to add a little bit more watts to my PSU, and I'm planning on adding more to this PC in the future, so I'm just kind of future-proofing myself, just in case I don't have to throw out this old, you know, PSU and get a new one with even higher wattage. But if you want to save money and not spend, you know, $200 on a power supply, that's totally fine. My computer back home has a 750-watt PSU, and it works totally fine. It's, I've never had any burnout problems or uh, shorts, so, you know, it's... This is a little bit too much, but I just wanted to play it safe. Woo! Okay, that was a lot to get through. Uh, let's all take a collective deep breath. All right, enough talking. Let's build this thing. All right, to start this off, we have our case here and it's stripped on both sides. We have access to both sides. Something you wanna make sure of is that you don't have any static on your hands. This is a plastic table, so not much static is going to be carried through to the really sensitive parts. I'm going to wear some rubber gloves just uh, in case. So if you have some rubber gloves laying around, that's gonna help a lot. You just can't be too careful with this kind of stuff. Uh, you don't wanna fry your motherboard with some, uh, some static electricity just hanging out. All right, so first thing first, we're gonna install the power supply real quick because 
It's just kind of a pain whenever you get the motherboard in there and sensitive parts. You just want this to be already centered in whenever you start, uh, at least in my case. And this is with all the connections already set up. So I've already plugged in uh, all the power need for the motherboard, the VGA, uh, the SATA, uh, peripherals, CPU, uh, more peripherals. So this is all that came in the box uh, and it's ready to go. Uh, so you're going to want to install it fan side down. In the case of my case, um, it has just an opening right here and all it has to do is just slide in from the side. So I'm going to pull this and bring it in over here. Uh, tuck away your cables just to make sure that they're not too messy. I'm gonna bring it over and then line it up with the panel whenever you get it inside there. Alrighty. So it's lined up right now with all the screw ports right there. Uh, your power supply should come with four screws, a little bag. All right, so all you're gonna do is just find where the openings are. You're gonna be lining up, line them up again in case uh, they get this line and you're moving around the case. Pop that in right there and start screwing away. Now, it's going to look like a giant rat's nest of cables here, but uh, we usually do cable management at the end of the, uh, the process because you don't want to start organizing cables whenever you have to, you know, reshuffle something or replug something. So it's a lot easier just to have them, you know, just sitting out for now and then we'll plug them in later. All right, next up on the list is to install the motherboard. We're going to get our motherboard out. And if you see in here, there's going to be little slots. Uh, it's going to match up to what your motherboard is. Whenever you lay down your motherboard inside, it's going to fit to the screws that it's specified to. It's pretty user-friendly. So here we have our motherboard. And this is a static protective case. Uh, and whenever you take it out of the static, it's uh, just be careful with it. This is what's protecting it from being shocked and accidentally frying the motherboard. So um, I'm going to touch something metal real quick just to, in case my gloves got static. I don't know if that's possible. Science rubbers, eh, okay. <laughs> We're good, we're safe. All right, so I'm gonna safely take this out of the packaging. Now we're going to lay it inside of this area. Well, it seems to have lined up, so I'm pretty happy with that. You can see there's little ports right here that we're gonna have to screw little screws in. So let's find the correct size screw for that. If you ever get confused uh, whenever you're installing something or you get lost somewhere, always consult the user guide if you need to. Uh, I mean, I've built before, but sometimes I still need a refresher, so I consult the user guide. Also, I don't want to damage anything and want to make sure one out of these five uh, bags of screws, what's the correct screw to get this motherboard inside is. So, you know, better safe than sorry. Now, don't screw them too tight. You don't want to harm the motherboard. Just make sure they're snug and they can hold. I highly recommend getting a magnetic uh, screwdriver that holds the screw in place because whenever you're trying to get in really hard to reach spots, it's going to be a pain to try to prick it in there with your finger and then get your screwdriver in there. So get something with a little magnetic tip so you can just, you can just attach the screw right here. It's a lot easier. So my motherboard is securely in the chassis and the next thing we're going to install is the CPU. So let's get started on that. All right, with our motherboard secure, we are going to start installing the CPU now. So all we're gonna do is just take it out of the box. Uh, make sure it's taken out carefully. This is really poorly designed. It's just like a top. Uh, <clears throat> there it is, okay. Now, this is one of the things that you have to be super careful with. These guys are very, very delicate. And I'm just gonna take this out. And it's just this little tiny piece right here, if you can see this. Um, you're going to be placing this inside of the CPU holder right here. And uh, there's no screws involved in this. All you're going to be doing is just placing it uh, inside as you lift this cover. So with uh, this, there's going to be a little golden triangle at the bottom left corner of your uh, CPU. And you're going to want to line it up with the little golden corner. There's going to be a corner uh, in the CPU holder right here. Uh, so just line those two up together. Now I'm going to lift the CPU cover up very carefully. And it's just gonna pop up just like so. 
my CPU delicately out. Make sure not to try to touch anything. I'm gonna place it right inside. It's gonna fit snug and you'll, you'll, you'll see it pop in. Uh, so that is correct. This is gonna come down. Man, it, it just feels like it's gonna break, but it's securely in there now. So your CPU is now installed. Good job. Uh, as you can see right here, it's looking pretty. Um, next up, we are going to put in the RAM. Uh, me and mine as well, so I'm gonna grab that. Now with your RAM, if you have four sticks, all you gotta do is just line them up in each concurrent spot. So the recommended memory configuration for my motherboard uh, with just two RAM slots is gonna be A2 and B2. So I'm gonna install my RAM that way. All right, so I gotta be honest, my top-down camera decided to stop recording, and because it was above my head, I did not see that it was stopped recording. So here is a dramatic reenaction of me inserting my RAM into my motherboard. All right, you get the picture. Back to the build. All right, so the RAM is now installed, and next up we are going to install our M.2. We're going to remove our, our M.2 drive and open it up. God, it is unbelievable how small this thing is. It's, it's mind-blowing that, you know, I used to have, like, stacks of, you know, old uh, HDDs and they would only add up to, like, a terabyte, you know, five, six years ago. And now, like, <laughs> two terabytes are held into this little thing. All right, so we got our M.2 drive inside and we've removed the uh, cover for the thermal paste right here, if you can see that. This is a little thermal, like, uh, insulator that will connect to the heat sink right here. So all we're gonna do is just connect it back. Alrighty. Just going to set that right on top. Very delicately. Alrighty, so that's connected. I'm gonna find my other screw real quick. Because I lost it. Oh God. This is why you should get a little magnetic holder for all your screws because um, I lost mine. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's keep it calm. Let's try to find it before we freak out. And there it is. Right there on the ground. Dumb, dumb, idiot town. All right, get it in the slot. Then just screw that down. Your M.2 drive is now installed. Good job, everybody. Clap your hands all around. And everybody, clap your hands, because we are building our computer today, and it is pretty grand. Bah, bah. Hard drive is installed, so let's move on to the CPU cooler. All right, so we got our Kraken liquid cooler. This thing is a monster. I love, and NZXT just makes really quality product. I'm not paid by them, but I, I'm a fan of all the stuff they do. Um, they just put a lot of thought into their, their process and their builds. So I'm gonna take this bad boy. It's radiator out of the box. Radiator, toi, radiator as the French would call it. So here we have our cooler, and we're going to be mounting it right here on the inside of that case. So we got our spacer and our liner here for the back. I've never installed a liquid cooler before, so have some patience with me on this guy. All right, after a uh, man versus computer, uh, power struggle. I finally figured out how to install this uh, CPU cooler. So how I did it was I got the radiator and you attach the fan brackets to the back of it. You want to make sure that the fans are going to be blowing into the radiator because you want to cool it as well. Uh, so that's it's pretty easy. The label will show you uh, if you can see under here like it's it's pretty flush and the other side is like more technical details so um, unless you want to go into a different kind of build where it sucks air but that's way more complicated than you need to think about this is the build recommended uh, by the manufacturer so all you got to do is install to install this is just bring it inside now we're getting somewhere there it is all right so that is installed uh, let me double check to make sure that the fan components are not trapped in there you can see it on the other side that i'm trying to reach through here it's gonna pop out right there. And the other one, if I can find it, uh, it's up here. I'm just gonna go through there. There's two little holes that it's gonna fit. Let's see, there it is. All right, now I can pull it from that other side 
And now both fan wires are exposed and we don't, we won't run into any more problems. Probably should have uh, unraveled these while I had a chance, but you know, you live and you learn with a PC building. Uh, it's a lot of trial and error. As you can see, the water cool bracket is installed correctly. Uh, I'm just finger screwing these in real quick. Uh, then I'm gonna take my screwdriver and uh, make sure it's completely bracketed in. So now we're going to connect our radiator to our uh, CPU. Right here is just two, uh, or sorry, four uh, spacers that's going to hold up your uh, water cool radiator. And uh, it's gonna come with instructions on which ones fit which uh, processors, but I installed the correct ones for mine. Uh, spacers are correct. So this radiator actually comes with thermal paste already on it. So if you see right here, I don't wanna touch it and ruin it, but uh, usually if, you, if a radiator or a CPU cooler doesn't come with uh, thermal paste, you're gonna wanna buy some uh, and make sure you only put a like pea-sized uh, dollop of thermal paste on there uh, because you don't want it you know, uh, leaking all over your other components. Uh, there's another video that I saw of a build <laughs> of a uh, nameless uh, a company who sprayed it all over their CPU and it looked ugly. <clears throat> Lines are a little finicky, so you just gotta make sure that they're gonna fit correctly and uh, not get in your way. So I'm going to gently place down my CPU onto the spacers and make sure they're good on all sides. You don't want that thermal paste to touch anything else but the CPU. So I've got mine in now and I'm just going to drop it down and give it a little press just to make sure that there's a connection between the CPU and the radiator. And these little things right here is what you're gonna be using to connect it uh, and solidify it. So I'm gonna crank that in together. And then afterwards you can bring your uh, heavy duty screwdriver in and that's really gonna spread that thermal paste all across and make sure it's pretty tight. You want a really solid connection. Well. From what I can see, it looks like it's solidly connected. And we're done with the water cooled section, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause. I'm gonna take a break and clean up all this stuff before we move on to our next section, because uh, it's a little bit more sensitive. Uh, so, intermission. So we're back and now it's time to install the graphics card. This is gonna be our final piece of the puzzle and then after that we're gonna start cable management. So let's get started, open this guy up and start putting it in. I pulled this out of the case earlier and dude, it just looks super cool to me. Uh, I like the all black color that they got with it. Um, it really kind of fits the, the color scheme that I got going here, a little white and black action. You know, if you're bargain hunting, sometimes you won't be able to get the same colors. That's fine, I mean, only you're gonna be the one seeing your PC every day, so it all depends on what you want. Here we have our EGVA GeForce RTX 2080. Give it a little shout, give it a little show to the camera. Ooh, God, it's pretty. Here it is, got it covered here. Um, so we're just gonna be inserting it right in here. Um, into our first slot. So always refer to your motherboard and see what slot that it prefers you uh, to be in. Uh, mine, it's going to have me put it into the uh, the PCI EX161. Uh, that's the preferred slot for the memory card. So remember, always refer to your manual. So right now we're gonna remove the back plate. Uh, this thing is holding in all the rest of our uh, plate connectors. And here we're going to remove two so much easier whenever you got a magnetic topper. I'm telling you, they're like five bucks, just invest in one. Especially if you're doing this kind of stuff, it's night and day. You're gonna make mistakes every now and then, it's okay. Sometimes you get something wrong, and it's all right, you just gotta keep on keeping on. As my dad always said, you can't break a chicken unless they hatch, <sighs> whatever. All you really have to do is just get it into the PCIe uh, 16 by one slot. Okay, I'm gonna punch this in. Now it's time to screw back in screw holes so you can secure it to the chassis. Well guys, that officially means that all of our components on our PC are installed. 
That's very good, but that's also very uh, terrifying because we're about to walk into one of the hardest phases and that's cable management. Uh, making sure everything's correctly plugged in and it looks good while it's doing it. So first thing is first, we have all of our cables assembled. Uh, let's plug in the largest cables first and then we'll start adding the accessory cables on the side. Uh, you just want to make sure that your largest cables are you know, untangled and out of the way before you start getting onto the uh, smaller stuff. And that way we'll be able to have a little bit more adjustability. So on this, uh, we got our motherboard cable here. Um, if you see it, can't see it on that side. Our motherboard cable right here, uh, it's the biggest one uh, and it's gonna plug directly into a slot on your motherboard. So uh, I'm gonna lead it through here. Uh, we have a little bit of cable management uh, accessories here. I'm just gonna lead that on to right here. And the NZXT actually has a little hideaway spot. Let's just plug it straight in. Alrighty, so our motherboard is now plugged in. Next thing up is we're gonna want to put our CPU power in. And that's going to be up here. And our CPU power is actually gonna be right up here at the top left corner, if you can see, right here. So I'll route the CPU over here. <clears throat> I'll do some more cable management stuff afterwards, but you're just gonna slide it in through up there. And this is gonna be your cable right here. Uh, you're gonna wanna, there's gonna be eight sockets to plug into. Yeah. It's a tight little fit. It's tricky to get this guy in, man. Um, it's the interface or the IO panel on the back is really close up. Oh, I think I may have gotten it. Alrighty, heard the click. <sighs> we heard the click, so we got both of our powers, both of our things in there. But uh, that's gonna be good for now. So, CPU power is plugged in, motherboard power is plugged in. Let's get the GPU power plugged in. Um, I'm gonna feed it through the bottom. There's gonna be a little pull out here, I believe, for the graphics card. Yep, so slide it through here. You can see. One slide both cables through here. And then we'll pop them in right here. Feed that back out, get the slack out of there. So after a little bit of troubleshooting, I actually realized you had to plug in uh, both VGA cables into this power supply to get the fans running. Um, then I realized I just made a dumb, dumb mistake. All right, so we've got our main components installed already. We've got our graphics card powered. We've got our CPU powered. We've got our motherboard powered. Uh, let's get some power to the uh, CPU cooler then. The CPU cooler actually comes with more, some uh, more features like this USB plug that plugs directly into the cooler. Uh, this is to access like the color and uh, RGB uh, functionality of it. So let's feed it back first so we don't have to worry about feeding it after it's plugged. That'd be difficult. And then we'll give it a little plug right here. So I'm gonna plug my USB into an available slot down here. It also comes with a power cable that plugs into the top. So this guy right here, I'm just gonna plug it in directly. Cool thing about these CPU power parts uh, and cables is that they're designed to make sure that you don't plug it in the wrong way, um, except on a select few, but most of them have little clips and stuff that make you plug it in directly, uh, like the correct way, so don't worry too much about doing the wrong thing or plugging it the wrong way. You know what, that can be done better. Can be slid behind this guy. I just don't want any obvious, uh, you know, cables hanging out on top of uh, my motherboard. I like very clean lines. This, you don't have to worry too much about this as long as you're able to close the case um, because this is just a, the back panel. The front is going to be the glass where you get to show everyone your pretty colors. Uh, we've got all of our main connectors already connected with our motherboard, our CPU, our GPU, and uh, our uh, cooling fan. Uh, our liquid cooler. So next up is our case, all of our case cords right here. So that's what everything that's gonna come with your case. Audio connector is gonna be at the bottom right of this guy. So we're gonna slide this over. We need to plug in our other uh, stuff, which is our F panel. We also have this little connector that will show you exactly uh, what goes to what, uh, but you have an F panel that it just comes with it. So might as well just use that. Down here below, 
Now, so our F panel is now plugged in. That's going to connect to the motherboard, so you can turn it on, turn it off, uh, and also will access and give power to the LEDs on board and such. Looks like we're pretty set. Now we just need to do some uh, cable optimization. So. This is kind of a, the, the moment of truth in a sense. Uh, I have the power plugged in and I'm going to turn it on. And if it turns on, I'm hoping everything's going to look all right. We're going to check. Uh, there's little LEDs that not notify if everything's running correctly. Let's hope this doesn't break. Is it on? So here it is. We're running Premiere right now and it's uh, running at full resolution on both the preview and our source. And I've really never had a computer before that's run at full resolution while previewing and uh, you know pulling uh, from the timeline. So that's super exciting. This PC is now gonna be our office powerhouse for rendering or intensive edits. So, I mean, we now have something in the office that can grind through stuff that we've been struggling with. So if you want to build your own PC, remember you don't have to spend this much money on a good video editing PC. You can still run Premiere and After Effects on a computer that will cost you, you know, $800 to $1,200 to build uh, using some of the, I, I said some really, you know, uh, cheap, useful graphics cards and CPUs that you can use. Check out the Ryzen series of AMD, NVIDIA's 1050s and 1060s. You can get them in the marketplace for like $150, $200 right now. And it will edit HD footage really well. I mean, whenever you assemble all these components yourself, if something's lacking, you can always just replace that one part. And whenever you buy a stock computer, sometimes you're buying stuff that you don't need or you're just basically paying like a tax to the company that produces uh, the, the box. For example, like Alienware computers, uh, you're gonna be spending three grand on a PC that you can you know, spend two grand on a PC and get the same specs uh, and build it yourself. I mean, especially with Mac, this build for a Mac online is like seven grand. Think of building your own PC as an investment as well. Whenever I built my first PC for video editing back home, uh, not this one, a much cheaper one, uh, I invested about $1,200 into it, and after I took some freelance jobs that I was able to do now that I had an editing computer and I can uh, take in footage from uh, freelance uh, contracts and edit for them, uh, I was able to pay it back in like four months. So, I mean, it is a money-making machine if you know how to utilize freelance contracts and uh, if you have the machine to do it, I mean, you can make some money. So I hope this video helped you out and maybe pushed you a little towards the, the realm of building your own PC. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to let me know in the comments. If you want to roast me for something I did wrong, that's totally fine. It was a, it was a long build, so I probably made a mistake somewhere. Uh, I probably won't respond, but I'll read your comments and then have a fake argument with you in my head in the shower for about 30 minutes. And then after that, I'll uh, try to convince myself to try to respond, but then I'll be too terrified of confrontation to even do anything. So it's totally fine. So that's the end of this video. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel for more awesome content like this. And now if you'll excuse me, I've got a really important project to get onto. What? I'm benchmarking right now. Okay, that's <laughs> like half the reason that I built it.